every evening before we meditate, we chant the four sublime attitudes. Goodwill. May all living beings be happy. Compassion. May they all be free from stress and pain. Appreciation. May they not lose the happiness they found. And then there's equanimity. And instead of saying, well, everybody can just go to hell, I don't care. That's not what equanimity is all about. Because all living beings are the owners of their actions, heir to their actions. Exactly how is that thought related to equanimity? Notice that it comes forth in the list. In other words, you cultivate goodwill first, you cultivate compassion, you cultivate appreciation. But then there comes a point where you realize that, okay, sometimes you may have goodwill for people, but they're not happy. You have compassion for people, and they still don't get released from their suffering. You have appreciation for people. Okay, they've got happiness, but they abuse it. They abuse their power. They abuse their wealth. And you begin to realize there's only so much that you can do. And here we're talking not only about other people, but also about yourself. And that's where the reflection on karma comes in. Because when you realize there are certain things that are caused by past karma, there's no way you can influence them. Both other people's karma places limitations on them. Your own karma places limitations on you. And you have to live realis realistically within those limitations. You can push them a little bit. You're trying to push the envelope to see how much you can help people, how much you can work for your own happiness and for that of other people. But there comes a point where you realize, okay, you can only do so much at a time, so much with the energy, so much with the talents that you have. And so the appropriate thing is to put aside the things that you can't help, or you can't make a difference, and focus on the things where you can. Again, that's what the chat on karma is all about. It's to give you a sense of priorities. Remind yourself of what's important. Okay, you've got limited amount of energy, a limited amount of time in this life. You help where you can, but if you can't help, then there's no point in getting upset. There's no point in suffering for it. No point in expending your energies in areas that you just can't make a difference. Because you only have so much. So the issue is to use it wisely. That's part of what it means to, whatever you do for good or for evil to that, will you fall heir. Use what you've got skillfully. So the teaching on equanimity is not so much a cold indifference, but it's just reminding you of where your priorities are, where your limitations are, and learning how to work within those limitations and not wasting your energy on things outside, outside of those limitations. In other words, if an issue is something about your own past karma, okay, you realize you can't change that. What you can change, though, what you can shape, though, is what you're doing right now. So focus there. There's a passage where the Buddha talks about the skillful and unskillful ways of teaching karma and of thinking about karma. An unskillful way of saying, okay, everybody who does evil is going to go to hell. Everybody who does something bad is going to suffer. And you look back and everybody's got something bad in their lives. The times when you acted on less than noble or less than your best intentions. And if you simply brood on the fact, well, I made that big mistake, okay, that just gets you into a spiral that goes down. It doesn't help at all. But if you can always remind yourself, okay, that there is past karma, but there is also new karma, which is really a fresh slate. You can choose freely right now to act as skillfully as possible. Okay, whatever you've done in the past that was unskillful, just put that aside. Make up your mind you're not going to make that same mistake again, and then move on. 
So it's not that you deny your mistakes. You freely admit them. And it's not that you're blasé about them. You realize, okay, what was a mistake is a mistake. You don't want to make that mistake again. But if you simply brood on the mistakes you've made in the past, you don't have the energy left to really act skillfully in the present moment. So again, it's an issue of priorities. Where are you going to focus your attention? Where are you going to focus your energies to get the best results? And so that phrase on karma, having to do with equanimity, is to focus your right there, where the true issue is, what the basic structure of reality is. So you're not, don't get all, get all caught up in, well, what about if this had been that way or if that had been this way? All those what-ifs about the past really are a lot of waste of time. The, the important what-if is, okay, what if I act skillfully now? Okay, try that out. So Buddhism doesn't teach heartlessness. It starts out with goodwill. And you look at the path, it's an issue of Okay, working for your own well-being, for the well-being of those around you. That's goodwill put into action. The teaching on equanimity is to make sure that it doesn't fall off the road, doesn't burn out, get used up in unskillful ways. In other words, you don't have equanimity about your choices in the present moment. Well, say, who cares what happens? in the present moment. You can't think that way. You have to let goodwill and compassion and appreciation be very dominant in your choice of how you're going to act right now, and right now, and right now, as the present keeps moving through time. You can't be indifferent to that. There's got to be a strong sense of desire, a strong sense of purpose, resolve. to focus on doing what's the best thing you can possibly do each moment that you're aware of your choices, and then trying to make yourself more and more aware of exactly what choices you're making. That requires a lot of energy, a lot of input. So the teaching on equanimity basically husbands your resources so you can focus them on the spot where they're most useful where they really will make a difference. You develop equanimity about the path only when you've attained the goal. And even the equanimity you feel when you've attained the goal, there's, there's a transcending of that as well. Some of the texts talk about non-fashioning. In other words, you realize that equanimity is a choice that you make. Okay, these are the things you're going to put aside. These are the things you're going to focus on. The things you put aside, you really do have to let yourself not get worked up about them. Okay, when the path is finally completed, that's the point where the path comes into the realm of equanimity. And then you let go of that. Don't fashion anything at all. And that's when the mind gains release. So it's a selective equanimity up until the end point of the path. And that way, instead of being a, a blanket indifference to things, which would be like that of a dead person, it becomes a very important tool in keeping you active and making sure all the energy and activity you've got to devote to the present moment is devoted in the right spot, is used in the best way possible. Otherwise, you drag yourself down by taking on too many responsibilities, too many cares. And when you do that, you, nothing, nothing much gets accomplished at all. It's when you focus your energies properly, okay, that's when they pay off. So as we 
develop our meditation. We want to bring the mind to concentration so it can attain this state of equanimity from which you continue your work. In other words, you have equanimity for everything else. At that point, aside from the development of insight, then the equanimity serves to protect you as well. And John Fuang once said, if you don't have that equanimity of jhana, your suffering is, excuse me, compassion is going to cause you suffering. Goodwill will cause you suffering because you see how limited your ability is to really help other people. Or you run against the limitations created by your own past karma. And exactly how much you can do, accomplish at any one time. If you develop the proper equanimity to that, okay, you don't have to suffer from those limitations. You just recognize them and then work in the areas, okay, where that are open to you. So equanimity is an important part of nourishing you on the path, giving you strength, making sure that your basic goodwill for yourself and other people gets properly directed and doesn't get squandered. So don't think of equanimity as a heartless or cold state of mind. It's just a very realistic way of looking at things. Notice in the four sublime attitudes, the other three are, may all living beings be this way, may all living beings be that way, may all living beings be that way. Get to the fourth one. All living beings have, are the owners of their actions. There's no may in there. It's just a statement of what is. You recognize reality. You recognize the limitations in this causal realm where we, where we operate. And then you make up your mind that you're going to work with those limitations in as creative and as effective a way as possible. Someone once wrote a book on Buddhism. They called it the intelligent heart. And this is precisely what these four attitudes try to develop, is an intelligence in the way the heart, the will, your motivation function in your life. So that you get the most out of them. 